Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here. Stan Osterman coming to you live and direct from Kailua, Hawaii, where it's an absolutely gorgeous day, probably about 83, 84 degrees, nice cool breeze. And if, if you need a vacation from hot snow, come on over. Looking pretty good over here. Before we get started today, because it has been a very, obviously, very busy, busy week since last week with everything going on in Europe and in, um, in, in Ukraine. But before we get started on that, I do need to make a, a pitch for Renew Rebuild Hawaii has a webinar going on this Friday, the 4th of March. It starts at 1030 Hawaii time and goes to noon. And they're going to be talking about putting together a space mission or space missions or space industry in the state of Hawaii and what that could mean for our economy. So if you're interested in that kind of topic, uh, check out the Renew Rebuild Hawaii website and sign up for that webinar. Today, we have back with us uh, one of my favorite, favorite guests, Dan Goen. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of, um, I don't know what, I want to say eye-opening for most people because uh, I think we've been distracted by so many different things between coronavirus and, and just inflation happening and everything going on in the U.S. But there is a lot going on in the world that, Unfortunately, I don't think we've been paying attention to or very good attention to for the last few years. And so Dan and I are going to are going to Dan's going to talk about it. I'm going to probably bring up some questions for him about what's going on with the price of oil. And is this just a transitory blurb on the on the price of oil and things will go back to normal after Ukraine's over and, and things like that. But we're going to talk about that today. So we're back on the macro energy scale today. And the implications, I don't want to be a spoiler, but the implications are much bigger than just inflation. So, Dan, Dan Goen, welcome back to the show. And um, I appreciate you being on because I know you've had a really busy weekend and uh, you're looking at a whole lot of stuff, but uh, welcome back. Well, thanks, Dan. And you and I talked quite a bit and you actually asked a lot of good questions to me. And that makes me dig and that that helps out everybody else whenever we all dig and we've got a lot better information. So. So everybody that's uh, that watching this YouTube, this is this is well. If it isn't initially painful after you've slept on this one for a night, it it, it probably will become a little bit more painful. We can get slide number one, please. Okay, and I'm just making a pitch for the company, and we'll switch quickly switch over to slide number two, please. Oh, slide number two, the previous one. Great. Oh, okay. I think we're missing one there. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what that is, that's a graphical depiction of all the pipelines from Russia going into Europe. The uh, green ones are for the natural gas, the red ones are for oil. The, the Russians provide uh, approximately 40% of the gas that flows into Europe. As far as the oil, they provide anywhere between four to five million barrels per day of oil going into Europe. Uh, just as a note, I, uh, last week, uh, the Russians turned off gas going into Ukraine. The invasion was, uh, was Thursday. This weekend, uh, already two of the pipelines in Ukraine have already been destroyed. Um, okay. Currently, it looks like um, Russia is in the process of starting to slowly close off um, all the other uh, supplies of energy going into Europe. No, Dan, let me interject there. You know, we have we had some other data that uh, we don't have a slide for, but just for the sake of discussion, NATO is already pretty dependent on Russia for oil. Even the U.S. has a dependency on Russia for oil. But just to give you a, an, an idea, northern Macedonia is 100 percent dependent on Russia. Finland is 94 percent dependent. Bulgaria, 77 percent. Slovakia, 70. Germany, 49 percent. Italy. 46%, Poland, 40%, and France, 24% dependent on Russia for uh, natural gas and, and you know, yeah. their, their energy. Yeah. The, and, only, and... the only one in that list that's not a NATO member is Finland. Every single other country there is a NATO member. Yeah, and so, I'm going to add. I'm going to add another one to your list there. That's not not. Uh, I know what side you're looking at. Uh, for example, Turkey, and I'm going to say Turkey is 100%. And here's why. So um, the, the countries that provide natural gas into Turkey are Russia, Azerbaijan, and Iran. The gas company in Iran is Gazprom. The gas company in Azerbaijan is Gazprom. Gazprom 
is the state-owned oil and gas company owned by the Russian government, right? So effectively, Russia controls 100% of the natural gas going into Turkey. So uh, next one, please. Okay. Uh, so um, now there's a couple of the commodities we're going to talk about that, that aren't on the list, but, but there's quite, a, quite a, a, a good thing here. So between Russia and Ukraine, between those two countries, that's 80% of the world's sunflower oil, 30% of the world's wheat production. If you throw in China with them, that's over 50% of the world's exports of wheat, 20% of the world's corn. Um, there's another aspect of this too, and everybody needs to, to realize this, that one out of every five bags of fertilizer come out of Russia. So on January 10th and 13th, that was the, uh, the date that the Russians uh, sent that list of demands to the United Nations and were turned down on the 13th. January 19th, the, the president of Iran, Ibrahim Rassini, made his speech in front of the Dumas asking for a permanent military per, Russian military presence in Iran. And July, January 23rd, the following countries stopped the export of fertilizer to the world. Those four countries are Russia, China, Turkey, and Egypt. All those countries on exactly the same day stopped exporting fertilizer onto the world market. The Russians also produce 45.6% uh, of the world's palladium, 15.1% of the world's platinum. They own the second and third largest gold mines in the world. We've already talked about oil and gas. They provide all the nickel that the Europeans use to make stainless steel. It's uh, about 5.3% of the world's stainless steel, coal, copper, silver. Uh, the Russians provide all the coal that goes into Korea and all the coal that goes into Japan. Oh, yeah, rem correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you, uh, didn't we talk about Russia um, actually um, increasing their holdings in gold and decreasing their holdings in dollars? Yeah. Yeah, I sent you out some graphics uh, the, ja the, the, from, the, uh, from the Russian uh, finance ministry. Uh, almost 30% of the Russian rubles backed by gold. No dollars. They de-dollarized their economy. And why they de-dollarized, uh, we're going to find out here in a minute why they de-dollarized. Okay. So we can go to the next slide, please. Next, next slide here. This is uh, taken from the... Uh, uh, from the Merck, from the Mercantile, the, the COMEX, and that's just all the commodities that are denominated in dollars. Up there in the right-hand quarter, the word DAX, you see there it says the 30-year, 20-year, was a five-year, two-year uh, notes. Those are those bonds, U.S. government securities, what they actually use to trade all those commodities, and that's from crude oil to pork bellies to soybeans, right, are paid for in dollars. Um, the reason why I'm pointing this out is we're going to find out how important this is here, here pretty soon. Yeah, and we know that that slide's a little complicated to see on a screen, on a computer screen, but, you know, we know that folks are going to be watching this on YouTube and be able to Deposit. stop, freeze it, yeah. Yeah, and, and blow it up and look at it. But um, at it. that's yeah. some really important data to be looking at right now. Yeah, go to the next slide, please. What this has to do with, uh, has to do with currency reserves, so uh, or currency swaps. So the Central Bank of Turkey and the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates have a currency swap, and that's uh, so that's uh, uh, Turkish lira for UAE dirhams. Um, the follow and, and basically how this works is where the two central banks get together, or banks in those two countries, and they basically trade VPN information and they put together agreement to basically swap each other's currencies. In the last six months, the following uh, countries have put together currency swaps. There's currency swaps uh, between Argentina and Russia, between Brazil and Russia. There's a, a three-way currency swap between Venezuela, Russia, and China. There's currency swaps between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And there's currency swaps between India and Russia. And all that's happened in the last six months. Argentina and Brazil, that's happened in the last two months. And could you give us an idea of how much um, that activity has displaced trading in American currency, the reserve currency? We're going to talk about in the next slide. Um, okay. Uh, we can go to the, the, the next slide, please. And to remind everybody, 
you know, we, we talk about these currency exchanges and the reserve currency of the world, which is basically the U.S. dollar right now, because it all ties back to oil and purchasing oil, where the oil reserves are, where it's traded from, and, and how many economies depend on it. And that's why this stuff is so important, and it is all energy related. The, the, the point is that last slide is there is no dollars in it. That's right. the key. Was not just these countries swapping their own currency. So, well, that there basically is that's the that's the question that that uh, one about Taiwan. Um, that one right there. What's going on there is remember we talked about the palladium. Uh, palladium is used in CPU and computer chips. Um, what what's in Taiwan is a com company called TSMC. That's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. That is ninety percent of world chip manufacturing capacity. Vladimir Putin is in the position to hand to China 45.6% of the world's chip manufacturing capacity to Xi Jinping. The Chinese have always coveted chip manufacturing. Now understand that when it comes to uh, this capacity that the, the Chinese don't even have to invade Taiwan. All they have to do is they could destroy or capture TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Facility. And since this, this is all uh, this chip, chip manufacturing uh, is in a very specialized factory, it has to be hermetically sealed, no dust or so forth. So just by simply taking that building out, the Chinese could capture at least half the world's chip manufacturing capacity. Not only that, but force chip manufacturers to force them to do their manufacturing inside of China for simply because they won't have access to the palladium for making those computer chips. And the last slide, please. And, and if you hadn't been watching the news, the trouble with uh, auto production in the U.S. has been lack of chips. Yeah. So that's yeah. why this all ties back to the U.S. economy. Yeah, as a matter of fact, here in Indianapolis, I could take pictures of uh, the area surrounding me. We've got uh, uh, huge lots full of hundreds of cars. These are cars that the only thing missing are chips to complete the cars uh, all around Indianapolis. So I, 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 I'm I right in the middle, but I can, I'm can i uh, a witness to all of it. Okay, so the last page there. So what that is, uh, that was uh, taken August 6th of 2020. It says Russia and China ditched the dollar and moved to a for financial aid. So since 2015, Russia and China have been reducing their dependence on using the dollar for trade. Uh, what they put together is something called the Shanghai Corporation Organization, the CSO. China has a, a system that does the same thing the SWIFT system does. We transmit dollars using the SWIFT banking system between banks here, here in the West. Well, the Chinese have developed a system called SIPS, uh, CIPS. The Russians have a similar system. It's called the uh, System for Transfer of Financial Messages, which is SPFS. And what those two have basically agreed to do is take those two systems and merge them together. Um, and the, that um, culmination, that the, uh, the decision to make that happen, happened at that uh, meeting with President Ibrahim Rissini of the president of Iran, basically when Russia decided to do the 20 year deal with the Iranians and move permanent military assets into Iran. Hey, Dan, what is, what is that article from? What publication is that from again? Uh, I know you sent it to me, but I, I don't, don't have it on my computer. It's screen. called press.co. Press okay. Press.co is what, what, what I sent it from. Uh, and I, I guess that's some publication there in the Middle East that we're talking about. Um, I've been trying to get some, uh, some clarification on that system. So uh, today, this afternoon, I was talking to some futures traders that are in Qatar. And what they're telling me, uh, well, first of all, the, the three founding members of the system, they've got accounts in the system, and that's Russia, Iran, and China. And understand this is a, initially, they started using this system for trading energy, mainly oil and, and, uh, and, and natural gas contracts. Um, they've since then added the, a number of com uh, countries to this new system. The countries that they've added to the system are Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Turkey, Pakistan, India, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Oman. So these countries have already started using this new uh, banking system for trading oil and gas futures. And with that list of materials that, uh, that Russia exports like the palladium 
and the wheat and those commodities are probably start trading those commodities on this new system also. Um, now, going back to Ukraine, and I'm going to talk about the oil here in a minute, right? And, and, and the, the ramifications for everybody. Uh, and this is a kind of a note. Uh, uh, so I was talking to some of my uh, some players in Africa this weekend. And what they told me is about every Russian um, uh, mercenary in Africa has pretty much packed their bags and they're headed for uh, Ukraine. Uh, to understand this, well, to understand Russia to begin with, but Russia is basically uh, a, an oil company with an army bolted to it and a weapons lab. Russia uses conflicts to basically try out new military hardware and prove them and do product improvement, and they use those conflicts for weapon sales. So, so sometime here in the future, more likely the Russian army will move out of Ukraine, the, the mercenaries will move in, and it'll turn into a low-burning conflict like Syria, and Russia just pours in money, food, and ordnance. You know? And it, it's been a low conflict over the last 10 years, and that's probably what it's going to continue to be. I know here in the West, we'd love for it to go away really quickly, but that's probably not going to happen. Now, the trading system that these guys have put together, this new CIPS system, uh, it's denominated in yuan, so that's the reserve currency they use in this system. According to my calculations, the unholy trinity, the trinity is, is Russia, Iran, China and, Iran. and China, right? Uh, according to my calculations, they have jammed up at least 38.2 million barrels of oil per day. If the United States is to maintain control of the world's economy, we need to replace at least 29 million barrels of oil production per day um, as soon as possible. If so that means possible. tapping into the U.S. strategic oil reserves isn't going to do spit. 660 million barrels divided by 29 million or, yeah, yeah no, it isn't going to survive a year. Um, this, the World Bank, uh, they, the, somebody asked the World Bank to see what it would take if we could replace the natural gas that Russia is supplying into Europe. And uh, according to the World Bank, it'll take at least five years for us to build out enough infrastructure to replace the gas that Russia is pumping into Europe right now. So, so if I'm going to make a military guess, the Taiwan equation is going to be settled by China. And if China's going to settle that, they're going to do it in the next 12 months. And the reason why is because our new chip manufacturing capacity won't be online until next year. So there's a 12 month window for China. And remember what I said, the Chinese don't have to invade and take out Taiwan. All they need to do is take a building. Out. Yeah. And so, they can siege to Taiwan until they capitulate, especially so if they control 38% of the world's oil. So as we look at the big picture, we have a uh, demand for oil and natural gas in Europe and the U.S. that is going to be shut off with these sanctions we're pressing on, on Russia. Um, so the U.S. is going to have to produce more oil just to meet its own requirements because we buy from Russia. And we haven't shut off the purchasing of oil from Russia, but that's literally the only lever we have left um, and sanction mode to, uh, to to slow them down. Europe is totally dependent on natural gas right now. Uh, the only good news is it's coming spring and pretty soon summer, so maybe the requirement will drop off a little bit. But also, we have this, like you call the unholy trinity of Iran, Russia, and China building their own currency reserve, currency training, trading for oil, natural gas, and other commodities, other critical commodities. And right now, the, the real power that the United States has had historically since World War II has been the, the reserve currency. You know, the U.S. dollar can be used. I've been to, I've been to Guatemala and gone to the, the little Chick-fil-A place there. Of course, it's not called Chick-fil-A and whipped out American dollars. And they, they took the dollars and they gave me back their currency as change. Uh, you, could, you can do that with U.S. dollars. You can't do that with every currency. But it looks like the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians are working on replacing the American dollar. Yeah. Well, that, that last page I showed you, that was from August 6th of 2020, you know, uh, over a year ago. They've been planning this for a long time. We import 
you know, be, you, right around 4 million barrels of oil a day from Russia. If the Russians and the rest of those players on that group, they could turn around and say, yeah, we only sell our oil on that exchange and it's denominated in yon. We're going to be hurting because looking at our latest consumption numbers, we burn 22 million barrels of oil a day and we produce about 12. That means we're importing 10. And somewhere magically, 10 million barrels of oil a day will have to come out of somewhere just to supply our own economy. Not so, us trying to deal with Europe. So. so what would you say the impact has been when um, President Biden shut down the, uh, the pipelines and the oil leases um, on federal land to shut down oil production in the U.S. basically natural gas production? What impact has that one single move had in this whole European debacle that we're going through right now in Ukraine? Well, well, the pipeline was painful because I understand that was already in motion. And when he canceled that, if, if even if today we wanted to put all that back in place, it'll be two years before those guys can, can fire up arc welders again, right? That's just what it takes to line up those huge, huge construction projects to do that. Sure. When it comes to the oil drilling, when he killed all those leases and those drillers went into bankruptcy and scrapped a thousand rigs, we got to build a thousand rigs and we have supply shortages right now. There, there's a, there's a supply shortage for fracking sand. We don't have enough fracking sand to go out there and frack. And, and even if we, we are able to, to ramp up from the 600 rigs we have now up to 1600 and we can get our oil production up to 13 million barrels of oil a day, we're still short nine, you know, and when you're talking to, for example, the Canadians, uh, the Canadians were working on a, a second oil sands project. That's all been mothballed, you know, uh, and, and, and Mexico, their Cantrell's in terminal decline. We already talked about what's going on up in Alaska, you know, just because they're building that LNG pipeline up in Alaska, that means Purdue Bay is in terminal decline. That's the only reason you would do that. So we so, got some real problems here. So as we restricted our own production of oil um, a year and a half ago or a year ago, um, we we automatically kicked off a a basically a, a a supply shortage and a demand surplus. Therefore, we have prices going up on the gas and oil markets. Period. Like it's not a transitory thing. We're going to have that going because. Once we turn off the Keystone pipeline and we turn off all those leases, it's like it's like driving a big aircraft carrier. You can't just turn it and expect it to make an immediate turn. It takes months and months and months to get that equipment back on site, get the workers all signed up, get the equipment all orchestrated, get the resources you need lined up. It takes months to just get the thing back in production yeah. and and years to actually see the return on investment where oil's coming out the other end. It's hard if people understand these systems are so huge, they have their own inertia. It's like the Titanic. You can't turn it on a dime. It's like you pointed out, Stan, a lot of us have too. Even if we found a new, you know, a new Saudi Arabia today, you won't see that oil for five to 10 years just because of what you have to put in place to put it, put it online, to put all the production online. You know, so we're this is this is going to be painful for all of us. Very. Yeah. So again, I, go, I, I I wish I didn't have to tell that to the public, but I yeah yeah. Well, I go back to my mantra: of we need we need to do critical analysis before we make big decisions. And making a big decision like shutting down a pipeline and shutting down oil leases and turning the the spigot off here and stopping production there and shutting down our economy because of a virus that's probably just slightly worse than a, than the flu. It, those kind of poorly calculated decisions by our government has caused some significant problems. And tonight we're going to have a state of the state. I'm sure the president will say how rosy the whole world is um, and how great a job he's done. And quite frankly, I can't think of a single president in my lifetime that screwed up our country and the world economy as badly as Joe Biden. So I'm well, going to make that political statement right now. I'm just totally beside myself with how insane well, things are right now. Well, with just what I showed you just there in the week, let's say Ukraine, Russia, and you throw China. China is definitely, and I showed you the evidence, they're in the middle of this. 
right? There isn't any denying it. They planned this out for years. They waited to, for the perfect time to spring this plan. And you yeah. talked about Vladimir Putin, probably his health is figuring into this whole thing because he's done some speeches in the last number of weeks. And he's been very emotional about some of these speeches. So something's going on with him personally. Don't know what yeah. it is, right? But it's going on. But <laughs> But the thing about it is just the wheat thing, okay, we're going to get riots in the Middle East because a lot of those countries are very dependent on the rise coming out of Ukraine and Russia. And because of the trade sanctions, because of the conflict, that's offline. Now, the farmers around the world, because when I add up those four countries that shut down fertilizer exports, that's really close to half the world's fertilizer, half. So that means that, that farmers aren't going to be able to do plantings this year. This year's crop harvests are going to be poor. We are going to see famine in 2023. It's not if, it's not a theory, it's not a conspiracy theory. That is a fact. We are is the, famine is the ammonia production based on the, uh, the uh, natural gas availability? Is that the main yeah. source? Okay. Yeah, remember That's, we did the whole thing about yeah. the ammonia. 5% yeah, of the world's natural gas is consumed making ammonia. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really a sad state, and um, you know, just like the world has fragile ecosystems, um, right now the world's economy is is a fragile system, and you can't just go making willy nilly decisions that uh, are politically correct in your own country, especially when your country is the United States, and turn around and have those those decisions or those choices cause such huge ripples across the globe. Um, and we have done multiple, I think, horrendously bad choices um, that are that are wreaking havoc around the globe today. And I, I just shudder to think what it's going to mean for us in the not too distant future as a country. Yeah, it really yeah, it yeah, troubles yeah. me. I, I I apologize to everybody who listened to this YouTube. I I wish this hadn't played out this way, but it did. And, yeah, and, and just waited for the perfect time to do this. They they. Yeah, they truly did. It was you know, at this point. Something I haven't seen on on the media much from any media is the fact that if you look at Ukraine's history that goes back to, you know, at least to World War II, they've always been the occupied land. You know, the the Germans occupied and just destroyed them. They they did uh, a lot of the uh, ethnic uh, cleansing, the killing of of Jews and stuff was done in Ukraine. To the Ukrainian population. And so, and at the same time, when the Russians took over Ukraine from as the Soviet Union moved in, they they killed millions of people with starvation and brutality as well. So Ukraine has been brutalized from the Ger Russian side and the German side. And yeah. the sad part is that the resistance against Russia, a lot of those are neo-Nazis, or yeah. they still go back to the, you know, when the Nazis were fighting russia in world war ii and so they have those roots and a lot of the people that america is supporting now if you look back in their resume they have some neo-nazi stuff in them and that's making the the discussions really complicated when it's like how much money should we give ukraine and and, and who, who should we give it to there, there's another country out there that has a, a similar relationship uh and that's poland and Poland is another one of these countries. They've been sandwiched between the Germans and the Russians, and the Polish people have been well. They've been abused by both those countries. Yeah. You know, so I've I've known quite a number of Poles. I've been in Poland like a number of times, and uh, it's hard to understand it unless you've lived in one of those sandwich countries. And Poland's yeah. one of those sandwich countries, and in Ukraine sent a lot of the same history, a lot of the same painful history that goes yeah. back a very very long time. And, well, yeah, I know we hit the. We've hit the end of our time slot, but I'm just going to add, close it by saying I've actually been behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany when it was still behind the Iron Curtain. And it was highly depressing. Um, and it, has, it was a life-changing experience for me that I did in the military as an occupation troop in Berlin. Um, I got to go into East Berlin. And it's just, it, it was still damaged from World War II. People were living in buildings that were still, half the building was bombed out because the government couldn't fix it. You know, this, this Europe has a whole different way of looking at what's going on in Ukraine right now than the US. And I, and I feel like we have this uh, self-centered view of the world that's gonna end up eating our lunch. So anyway, Dan, thanks for being on the show today. I wish it was a more cheery, uh, upbeat show, but 
I think it's an important message that a lot of people need to be hearing. And uh, I thank you for helping pre present it. And we'll, we'll have you back in soon. Yeah, thank you, Stan. The last two weeks have been pretty painful, but thank you for letting me come on. Thank you. All right. And uh, from Kailua, Hawaii and Think Tech Hawaii, aloha. See you next week. Stan Osterman signing off. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.